So all of us want to be somebody. We're taught this. We are ingrained with this. All of us want to make something of ourselves. I can hear my grandmother's voice in the back of my head, Andy, do something with your life. But here's the question. Who gets to define success? Who gets to define the trajectory of our life that's going to lead for us becoming someone and something? Or what does it mean to be successful? Who gets to define that? And here's a question. This is a, a Christian question. This is one that comes right from Christ. What if making it, what if being successful meant being less? What if being successful meant being less? What if making it meant living a life that is eclipsed by the life of another? So how does that sound to you? Now, if that bristles you this morning, then uh, you probably have an over-infatuation with yourself. And you probably wouldn't want to uh, admit that, but all of us, if we're honest and we do a complete evaluation, all of us, we're more self-aware and more self-centered or more self-concerned than we realize or we would like to admit. The only true way for our success to be another's success is if we're serving something grander and greater than ourselves. The life that God has called us to in Christ, listen carefully, is a life of increase through decrease. It's a life of reflecting glory, never taking glory, and never being the source of that glory. The Christian life is a life that has an overwhelming awareness of the greatness of God. You see, we say that He is most, and since He's most, there's no room for us to boast. So I remember being in seminary, pursuing my doctorate and uh, some of my seminar classes. I was back in those days, I was a master of theology student in the midst of a group of uh, PhDs. And so I was already intimidated, needless to say. I didn't feel like that I belong. I became aware of something commonly known as the imposter syndrome. Has anyone ever heard of the imposter syndrome? Uh, some of you are shaking your head because you have still that imposter syndrome. Well, I'm happy to talk to you about it then. Uh, the imposter syndrome, it's an over-awareness of your limitations and your insecurities. And the imposter syndrome comes at us no matter how much success that we've had, and it says this. It, it's this attitude inside of us that says, boy, if they really knew. If they really knew how uh, little I know, if they really knew uh, how I, I am way in, way over my head, if they really knew that I didn't belong here, if they really knew I'm an imposter, they all belong here, but not me. I'm just putting up a fake facade and hoping that nobody gets to see on the inside. Now, I, had, I was confronted with that, especially in the midst of a bunch of PhD students we we're all pursuing the same degree. They were just further along the line than I was. And in my case, I had to confront my imposter syndrome by remembering this. And listen, in matters of theology, there are no experts. We're all beggars. But the same is true for all of you who are determined to make it. You're determined to make it. And so the question that I want to ask you, those of you who are trying to be something and somebody, who are you comparing yourself to? Who is it this morning that you're comparing yourself to? In my life, I remember praying things like, uh, God would make me like my heroes, Charles Stanley or Adrian Rogers. And I know that there's a lot of individuals in here who have no idea who those people are. And that just humbles me even more. But anyway, uh, I, I remember becoming convinced in my prayer that I was aiming too low. I remember a moment where the Lord said, you should be praying to be like Daniel or Joseph or Peter. But then I came to realize that even praying like that was too low. You see, the Christian life is a life fashioned in the image of Christ. The Christian life is a life fashioned in the image of Christ. We can't just assume this. I don't want to just assume this. Uh, in, in all my praying, not once did I pray to be like John the Baptist. You remember what Jesus said of John the Baptist? He said of John the Baptist, of those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. 
But I never prayed to be like John the Baptist. After all, he got his head cut off. Who wants to end up like John the Baptist? But see, the, the goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus. The goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus. And so John knew something that I, we have to learn, and uh, we will get to talk about it today, but here's what I am aware of. We'll talk about it today, but we're going to have to commit to learning this all of our lives. John knew something that we have to know. Becoming like Jesus comes first from the realization that He is who He is, and we are who we are. But it doesn't stop there. The beautiful truth of the gospel, the beautiful truth of Christianity is that God has become like we are to make us as He is. God has become like we are to make us as He is. Now, I say this oftentimes because I don't want you to get confused. That doesn't mean that we become gods, you know, little gods. We get to inhabit our own planet like, you know, other false teachers say. Particularly, I'm talking about Mormonism now. That's not what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean that we get to become gods. It means that we get to become gods, apostrophe S. That is, we get to be possessed by Him. We belong to Him. He is our beloved, and our beloved is our. Is, uh, we are His, and He is ours. And so, Jesus by saying that He has become like us in order to make us as He is, what that does is it gives us the reason then to embrace our weakness. The greatness of God and His acceptance of us in Christ, the greatness of God and His acceptance of us in Christ frees us from a false pursuit of success. Success. It gets us off the track for success. Because being accepted in Jesus, here's what it means. It means you can't do one thing to make Him love you anymore. It also means that you can't do one thing to make Him love you any less. That's the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so then what's success in God's eyes? Listen carefully. Success in God's eyes is living a life consistent with the life of Christ. Ours is always intimidate, or excuse me, imitating, reflecting, pointing not to ourselves or to the best that we can do, but to Him and all that He has done. It's a life in the words of John the Baptist that says, He must increase. I must decrease. In other words, the way up is down in the Christian life. So, take your Bible and join me in John chapter 3, and we'll look at that passage today. We're going to look at John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. And remember our series. We're tracing this series. Hopefully, you've had a chance to get your sermon journal, and you're following along. All the sermons and their themes are in there for you, as well as some resources that are in the back, as well as some dates for, that tells you uh, what's coming up next. But we're tracing this word sent through the gospel of John. And so, as we turn to John chapter 3, 22 through 36, I want you to listen for the word sent. And just as you're turning over there, remember our definition of what it means to live sent. Here it is again. We, living sent is a pattern of living fashioned in the image of God. That's what it means to live sent. This whole living sent kind of dynamic that we're going to become known for in our community. We're not going to become known, listen, we're not going to become known for this in our community because we say it at the bottom of First Baptist Start will live sent. We're not going to become known as that because we have it plastered on every uh, wall that you walk around. We're going to become known as that, listen, because God's going to do a work in the life of this church. He's already at work in your heart. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, position ourselves in the direction of God's moving, and we're going to get to see, I believe this, First Baptist, we're going to get to see God do a miracle because we're going to get to live this life patterned or fashioned in the image of God. And so we say this, this word living sin, it's a biblical word, and living sin is just another way of referring to the standard of Christian discipleship. And remember, a disciple is a follower. And so, in other words, you're following Jesus. What does it mean to live sent? It means you're following Jesus, and you're inviting others to come along with you. Now, that probably already hit some of us square in the nose, because some of us aren't following Jesus like we should. 
And so before we can, this is part of what we're going to experience together as a church. We're going to get to experience the renewal that God's going to bring personally in our hearts. And then from there, it's going to go to the next person. And then from there, the next person. And then once we fill it up in here, then it's going to go out there. And that's what we're going to get to experience. You say, how long is it going to take? I have no idea, but I'm glad we get to be a part of it together. We're going to get to, and I have to get back to my notes, otherwise I'm never going to finish. But we're going to get to experience, I believe with all of my heart, God is stirring First Baptist Church of Starkville. I believe that He is. I believe COVID-19, listen, listen carefully, has been an opportune moment providentially given to us by God for us to experience something new and better and greater than anything we've ever known. Now, are you, do you believe that with me this morning? Are y'all with me? That, that was a great place to say amen if you believe that. That was a wonderful place. You missed your opportunity. That's okay. As I continue to preach, there'll be more opportunities for you to say amen. So you just listen, okay? So let's read the text. Let's read the text. Let's get to the Bible. John 3, look at verse 22. After this, Jesus and His disciples went into the Judean countryside, and He remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Did you hear the word sent? Hopefully you heard it a couple of times. It was there for us in that passage. And so what I want to talk to you about today is I want to take that key verse there in verse 30, and I want to build the context around that key verse. I want to talk to you today about having a life that magnifies the Lord having a life that magnifies the Lord. Now, you answer this in your own heart. How many of you here today would say in this church service, in this church building, you would say, yes, I want a life that magnifies the Lord? Well, hopefully you're taking notes and you'll write this down. Number one, if you want a life that magnifies the Lord, beware of building your own kingdom. That's the first thing for you to be aware of. That's the first thing for you to mark. If you want a life that magnifies the Lord, you have to be aware of building your own kingdom. So go back to verse 22. You see that word after, after? That word after is important. That word after calls our attention to another one of our sent words. Look back at it. Start in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Look at what the Bible says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, where does that come? That passage, of course, is the capstone of our Christian confession, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's, uh, it's after the conversation with Nicodemus. It's after the conversation of Nicodemus that, uh, that Jesus makes His mission clear. It's after this, in verse 22, that we have our next sent word. And so there's a great reminder for us here. The purpose that we serve is larger than we are. I remember when I was at First Baptist Atlanta, there was a particular lady who died that we all remember. You know, it was a big church. Probably we had 5,000 on Sunday. And so, but there was one lady in particular that stood out because she was, she'd come through the decades at First Baptist Church. She'd been with them since they were at downtown and then at their current building where they are now. But she always wore hats to church. Every Sunday, she had a hat on. And so it came time for her to die. And uh, instead of flowers on her casket, they had all of her hats arranged on her casket. And I remember that just like it was yesterday. I remember, you know, Dr. Stanley walking around and he asked the question. He said, you know, when I, when I come to die, I wonder what you're going to put in my casket. I wonder what's the one thing that you're going to remember me by. And somebody said, well, the Bible. And he just laughed because he loved that. And I remember that. But when it comes your time, And you get to look back at the pattern of your life. Well, it's not just you looking back at the pattern of your life, is it? It's too late for you to look back. It's time for everyone else that knew you to look back at the pattern of your life. Here's the question, and you need to make this decision today. Do you want others to see you? Or do you want others to see Jesus in your life? It was Nicholas von Zinzendorf who Uh, God bless you, yes. It was Nicholas Zinzendorf who he encouraged his fellow Moravian missionaries with these words. Listen to this. He said, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Now, I've always thought that that was a funny quote because we remember who said it. But anyway, here's what he said. Preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. And so let me just ask you a question. How are you preaching the gospel? You say, well, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher to preach the gospel. Preaching just means proclaiming the gospel. And you proclaim the gospel sometimes when you don't say anything at all. You pattern your life after what it is. You pattern your life after your pursuits. And my question, and I'm confronting you with this question because the Bible is confronting us with this question this morning. What's our pursuits? What are we pursuing? And I even think personally, and there again, I can't get away from my notes. We'll never finish. But anyway, uh, I think about personally, I think about the metrics that our churches, and I'm not talking about this church. I'm just, or I am talking about this church, but not only this church. We've often talked about success by budgets and buildings, right? How big is our budget? How many people come to our building? That's how we measure success. And I think there's more. You know, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing. This past year, after COVID, 80%, some odd, that's what everybody says, 80%, our churches are filled at 80% capacity. But you know what's happened during this time? Our budgets have increased. 20% of the people are missing. But people who are here are giving more. What's the root of that? Here's what one of the things that I think is the root of that. I believe that God is challenging all of us who've been looking at buildings and budgets. He's been saying, why don't you start counting a different way? Why don't you start counting in a way that is more developed in kingdom metrics than it is by what you think that you're pursuing? Preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Are you living to be forgotten? Are you living to be eclipsed? I don't ever want to, and you have to help me here, church, because I'll I'll drift into this if you don't help me. I don't ever want to act like that I am not, I am irreplaceable. I want to be replaceable. I want to be easily replaced. Because what I stand for, I want somebody else to stand better than I stood. Someone to remind you more of Jesus than what I did. And that's my hope. That's my intention. 
And I want to ask you, if you're living to be forgotten, if you're living to be eclipsed, let me ask another question. Are you okay with that? Are you all right with that? It was John Piper who reminded us in his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. Listen to what he said. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake, but professionals are strong. Professionals are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. And I would add to that for our particular moment, we are sent by Christ as His ambassadors. We are not ambassadors of our own kingdoms. We are ambassadors of His kingdom. And any kingdom we build is going to crumble like sand. But His kingdom lasts forever. And so what are some of the, uh, what are some of the signs of that you're building your own kingdom? There again, so this is the sub-point, right? You've got number one, beware of your own kingdom. All that's going to come next is going to be a sub-point until I tell you number two. And number two is coming, but these are sub-points. So uh, I want you to dig into this text with me and learn some of the signs. So what are some of the signs that you're building your own kingdom? Well, sub-point number one, you're bothered by unnecessary things. How are you, what's a sign that you're building your own kingdom? Unnecessary things bother you. Look at verse 25. It says, a discussion arose over purification. But then notice this. The conversation shifts immediately to baptism. You say, what's that about? You say, well, baptism and purification, they, they go together. Well, not necessarily. I think what's going on in this text is the purification tone sets us up for what comes next. And the frame of reference, and if you've ha ever had a religious discussion, you've ever argued with somebody over religion, you understand this. Their frame of reference with so many of our religious discussions is more about personal kingdom building than focusing on Christ. It's my church. It's my ministry. It's my budget. You know, when I go to convention, well, uh, you pastor that church. Well, how large is that church? And, you know, I don't know why we ask that question to each other, but we do. Oh, you go to the First Baptist Church. <clears throat> yes, I do go to the First Baptist Church. It fits well into my portfolio building. It fits well into my particular scheme to belong to that type of church. But God's not concerned about that attitude. You know, what you, are, you know what it's like you're doing? It's like you're taking a flashlight, and you're waving it, saying, look at me. And then you're trying to get the attention of the sun, flashing that little flashlight into the sun, saying, hey, son, I'm down here. Look at this. God's not concerned about that. He's not concerned about our kingdom building. The quicker we learn that God doesn't need us, the better off you and I will be. The more grateful we're going to be to serve Him in His ways. And so in staff meetings, one of the things that we do here is we often pray not for the Lord to bless our efforts, but to direct us towards efforts that He is already blessing. God's not waiting upon us to move. He's already moving. He's moving in this community because the gospel is an unstoppable force. And so what we want to do is we want to join him in his efforts. Why do you think that China is one of the fastest growing places, in, uh, places of, of Christianity in the world, despite China's best efforts to tear down churches, despite China's best efforts to ban Bibles? You know, it's a funny thing. My Bible right here, this ESV, I open it, copyright 2000, whatever, printed in China. They'll let them come out, but they won't let them come in. So, in other words, why is North Korea, the place that the church is persecuted the most, why is it having the fastest growth rate? Here's the reason. Because the gospel is an unstoppable force. God is building His church. Our desire then in staff meetings when we meet is to say, Lord, move us in the direction that you're already blessing, and let us join you there. Give us eyes so that we can see what it is that you're doing and help us to join you there. And that way, we're sure that we're serving the right direction. You see, Paul warned Timothy about this attitude that John's disciples have. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 3 through 6, he says, Charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, 
not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that's by faith. And then he says this, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a sincere faith. Certain persons, he says, by swerving from these have wandered off into vain discussions. And I think that any time we focus about our own kingdom, and God knows our hearts, it's a vain discussion. One of the marks of Christian maturity is to be able to distinguish between things that matter and things that don't. Let me just say, you know, we often joke, and, and I'm not going to finish this message, Tom, by the way. But anyway, we oftentimes we joke and we say things, you know, like the church divided over the color of the carpet. That's things that matter and things that don't color of the carpet. God could care less if it was pistachio green or flaming red. He could care less. That's a good place to say amen, by the way. That's another good place. I am tired of watching our churches. We were talking with the president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, 17% of churches in Louisiana. I'm sure this is just Baptist churches. 17% of them don't have a pastor. 17%. And here's what else I know as being a pastor, as long as I've been a pastor. Some of those churches that don't have a pastor, they need to die because they've lost the mission. They started out fine, but they've become little outposts of their own kingdom. And it's lamentable. I hope that revival can happen in those churches. But sometimes the way that God moves through revival is a generation has to pass. A mark of Christian maturity is to be able to distinguish between things that matter and things that don't. If you're bothered by unnecessary things, then you are building your own kingdom. And if you're here this morning and you can't distinguish between what's necessary and what's unnecessary, then let that thought humble you. Look at what they say. They say everyone is going to Him. Everyone's going to Him. But look at the way John responds. He responds by seeing that they're really not concerned about baptism. You know what these disciples are doing, those who are closest to him? They're trying to appeal to John's desire for accolades. Remember, all of us want to be something. It's just what, who gets to define what the something is. Notice how John answers. Look at what he says. A person can't receive anything, not one thing, the Bible says, unless it's given to him from heaven. And here we learn another sign if you're building your own kingdom. You're living like you're in control. You forget the truth of this verse that God gives all things. We all like control, but but let me just tell you that there is such a great release. There is a great release when you realize that you're not in control. Andrew Murray calls it absolute surrender. John learned it. How long is it going to take for us to learn it? And if you're focused on all of my success, all of my efforts, and you constantly find yourself saying, look what I have done, then you've not yet learned the greatness of your insignificance. Thank you. You're a king of your own kingdom. And the population of your kingdom is you yourself, or me, myself, and I. But let's continue. John reminds his disciples of his mission, which brings us to the next sign that we're building our own kingdom. We forget our own mission. John says, look at what he says. He says, I'm sent. You see, when we talk about First Baptist Startville living this life of sent, we're trying to be like John the Baptist. And let me just say this, because in my mind, my mind automatically goes to, well, what happened to John the Baptist? He got his head cut off. That's right. But you know what? We serve a God who can put the heads of people back on. That's our confession. 
This is the reason why we do what we do. We are the ones who are sent. And listen, we remain sent. Look at verse 28. Again, let me go to the Greek with you just for a moment. Verse 28, the sent is in the perfect tense. You say, what does that mean? It means that he is sent and he remains in that condition of sent. He is sent and he remains sent. And remember this. Again, I want to hit you here because this is important. It's There's no easy dividing your life and the life of Christ. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, then Christ is your life. Being a Christian means that your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your life is now a life that follows Christ, that listens to Christ, that obeys Christ. And so what has he said of you? Here's what he said, John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, so send I you. You are sent. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the day you said yes to Jesus, you signed up, you enlisted to be in his gospel army. This is your call. It's not to sit, soak, and sour. It's not to come into our little holy huddles. It's to live a life with this message inside of us, not taking the light and putting it under a basket. No, no, you're going to let it shine. This is what it means. And so you're living in this pattern. You're living with a purpose And you realize that that's what satisfies. And if you've forgotten this, then you're in danger of building your life around things that you think satisfy. But reality, as the preacher says in Ecclesiastes, those things that you think that satisfy, they're really just ghosts that you're chasing. It's nothing more than vanity and wind. See, a sign that you've building your own kingdom as you forget what brings true joy. John says, look, he says, I'm not the focus. Look at what he says in verse 29. He says, I am a friend of the bridegroom. Now think about that image. All of the attention is on the bride and the groom. You've been to a wedding, you know, here. The doors open. All the attention goes back. And that groom Some of you are wise enough to do this. You watch the reaction on the groom's face, and you see, boy, mm, that's that moment that you'd wish lasts forever. And this is John's attitude. This is his demeanor. He says, I'm not the focus. I'm just standing as a friend of the groom. I'm just here, listen, attending, pointing, making sure that I stay unnoticed. I remember my granddaddy. He was a greeter at the church for years and years. And my granddad, he never felt qualified to be a deacon. He thought that serving as deacon was too high a calling for him. But he was there every morning at Mills Chapel Baptist Church. And all during the week, I remember going with him. He'd cut the grass, and he wouldn't take a dime from the church. Matter of fact, he found a $20 bill one time when I was with him. And instead of giving it to me to working with him, he gave it to the church. But anyway, I still remember that. And often folks would say to him, they'd say, Dan, don't you want to be a leader in the church? Dan, don't you want to do more than hold the door? And my granddaddy would always say, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the house of the wicked. I want to ask you this morning, Have you found what it is that brings you complete joy? You see, here's the the truth. The longer I serve Jesus, the more I want to serve him. The longer I give, the more I love him. And if I had a thousand lives to give, I'd give them all to Jesus. Where did we get this idea that that, uh, a life of serving Jesus is a life of lack? You want me to tell you what the real sacrifice is? The real sacrifice is not serving Jesus because nothing is more satisfying than serving Jesus. And I get to serve him as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a brother. And then I get to serve him as a pastor. And I just want to ask you, how do you serve him? You see, there's so much more to you than you think. You're created for more. You find the more when you find Him. 
You see, don't make the mistake of focusing on the present as if there's all that there is. And that's what they're trying to get John to do, which is another mark that you're building your own kingdom. You're focusing on the present as if that's all there is. You see, these closest to John, look at what they're doing. They're trying their best to have him focus on what was right in front of him as if that's all there is. But praise God that that's not all there is. In our world, it has this pattern. Live for the moment. Live for the now. Get it as fast as you can and then keep it as long as you can. But there's so much more. This is what makes serving Jesus so incredible. He both gives the more and is the more that satisfies. He both gives more and he is the more. And here's what we get to say as a follower of Jesus With Jesus, listen, there's always more. There's always more. And so now that you know how to not build your own kingdom, how do you ensure that you have the right focus? Very quickly, I want us to look at verse 30 through 36, and I'm just going to walk through these for the sake of time. Under this heading... Number two, develop the right focus. You say, well, what is the right focus for a Christian? Number two, sub point one, it's a life of increase. Look at what John said. He must increase, but I must decrease. I think we all need to say that together. He must increase, I must decrease. Let's say it again. He must increase. I must decrease. Did you know that those are the last words that John speaks in John's gospel? The last words that he speaks. And no greater word has ever been spoken by a follower of Christ. And that's just not my evaluation. That's Jesus's. Because Jesus said, of those born among women, none is greater than John the Baptist. What's another focus for us? Look at verse 31. We focus on the majesty of God. Look at the way John speaks. He said, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. Look at verse, look at verse uh, 30. Uh, 30, 31, he who comes from heaven is above all. So in other words, you focus on the majesty of God. Next, you focus on reality. And look at what 33 says. It says this, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this. In other words, this is the pattern of your life. This is the seal of your life that God is true. And then look at verse 34. Another way for us to ensure that we have the right focus, verse 34, is we have to remember who builds the church. Verse 34, look at what the Bible says. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And in verse verse 34, look at what it says. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. He gives the Spirit without measure. In other words, we remember it is who's building the church. It's it's His work. We don't, we're not, uh, we we don't cooperate with Him. We just get to, we get to come alongside Him. Remember our place? Yes, He causes us, He calls us to go, but we can't do anything if He doesn't move. We can't do one thing unless the Spirit of God is, is active. I have no hope, and I've, been, I've realized this more and more as I've prepared for this message. I have no hope for this message to make it other than just me being up here doing this and playing around unless the Spirit of God works in your heart. I'm hopeless. There's no reason for you to even come to church unless the Lord moves and acts. This is why we pray, because we realize that it's His work. It's His message. It's His work. We join with them in that work. We are, as Hudson Taylor said, we are those who bear not a single care ourselves because one is too much for us. We don't bear a single care ourselves because just one is too much for us. 
Instead, we confess the work is mine, Jesus's, and mine alone, Jesus's. And our work is just to rest in Him. There is such release for you here to cease your striving and to realize that He's God. Just serve Him and watch Him work. Take the next step. You can only imagine what's waiting for you if you can just get over yourself and get under Him. You see, that's the safest and most satisfying place to be. I must decrease. He must increase. The intention behind this message is to stir your hearts for you to hear God calling you. And let me say to you, it's never too late. This message is hard. I realize that. And we're going to have to focus on the truth of John 3.30 the rest of our lives. Don't let the distance between where you are and this verse keep you still. Instead, come to Jesus and live a life that magnifies the Lord. You say, where do I start? You start by confessing your sin. If you've not, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. See, then the rest of your life, you'll join with the rest of us and you'll sing, I surrender all. And you'll sing that song time and time and time again. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've I've done a lot of good, but I want to do more for Jesus. You know that there's more for you to do. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to challenge you to ask him right now, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then pray this. Lord, give me the strength to do it. Now, some of you know already that thing that you've been neglecting. Some of you know what it is He wants you to do. All of us are praying that you will have the strength to do it. Some of you say, well, I don't know what that is. You continue to pray. You continue to listen. You continue to seek. And God will show you what He wants you to do. Father, for us here, we all say the same. What do you want us to do? Give us strength to do it. Prick our hearts. Show us who satisfies. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.